And we encounter something undecidable, like the Uncanny Valley, whose area is it for? Was it yours, Natalie? What, sorry? Did you, did you speak about the Uncanny Valley? No, who, 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 who spoke about? The robots? Robotics? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. So, um, so it's again, it's this thing, this, this robotics thing, <coughs> it is simulacra, and it is unsett unsettling, because we like to know whether you are a human or a beast, a plant or a mineral, dead or alive. And this refuses to be either an object or an image. But it, it, it is trying to be an artwork. Yes. Um, so it's not a simulacra of an artwork, it's an artwork. Is that mine? Yes, it is mine. Um, no, no, it's not a simulacra of an artwork. And what a simulacra of an artwork would look like, that would be an interesting question to ask. Um, That's Jim Green's. It is, yeah, it is an artwork. Um, but normally, when we say, when I tell you, okay, I'm going to show you an artwork, you know what to expect. You expect to see some representation of reality. I, I, I will say, okay, I'm going to show you an artwork, and that will be, uh, I don't know how to spell it. Uh, Yeah, and that will be this. This is the artwork I'm going to show you. So this, you know, this is not surprising because it is a, a man-made thing that relates to something outside of it. You look at it, and it is, you recognize something like a body. But of course, you know that this is not a body. You know that it will not suddenly stand up and start walking. Yeah? You're not going to offer it a cup of tea. You are very clear in your mind that this is a representation of a thinker and not a thinker, even though I have to say the name is misleading. He calls it a thinker, but clearly this thing cannot think, yeah? because it is made of what? Copper, brass. So, uh, so I don't know why I call it that. They have to call it an image of a thinker or a sculpture of a thinker. Yes? It's not a thinker. Well, that, that evidently not. Um, it's a thinker because it's a prompt to create in your mind what it is to be a thinker. So it's irrelevant in a way that it looks like a thinker. It could look like a bicycle on So a I, I am the thinker. So I, I, well, he he says, says, you are the thinker. Yeah. You, you've yeah. been prompted to yeah. be create. I agree. But what is interesting is that no one will mistake this for a person. Yeah? You know that it is a representation of a person, or it, it, it mimics a person, or it modeled on a person. So there is a complete clarity, and, and we can discuss its aesthetic qualities. <coughs> we can discuss in what way this way of picturing the human being is true, deep, interesting, shallow, politically invested, uh, um, you know, anti-feminist um, celebrating forms of masculinity. Yeah, we, we can say all these things because we are completely clear in our minds that this is a representation of a person. And then we can ask a lot of questions about what kind of representation it is. Now, what is happening when we are looking at something like this? Yeah? Of course, you could still read it in the same way as a representation of a chair or a bicycle. And maybe, maybe there is a comment here about the, the traffic and how slow it is, so slow that you might as well be sitting on your chair or something. <laughs> you know, there could be all these things. But what I'm trying to say is that if you're going to read it like that, you miss the point. Because that's not the most interesting thing about it. The most interesting thing about it is that here, unlike in the thinker, uh, in in the, the in this unlike the thinker, there is no sense in which that is a representation of a bicycle. That is a bicycle. It's just a wheel. It's just a wheel. Mm -hmm. But if if you have a bicycle without a wheel, it it will do. Yeah. But not this. You know, if if someone 
needs a leg replacement, he will not say, I know what we'll do, we, we, we take his leg. <laughs> you know? That's not going to work. You see the difference? And this says, well, it kind of does work. This could work as an iron if you had a, a shirt when you have to iron on the buttonholes very carefully. Uh, it, it could work as an iron. It could work as a torture too. You know, it, it, it didn't leave the world of objects and cross the Rubicon or the letter into the world of images. It, sa it says there are no two worlds. There is only one world, and that's it. And this world is a world of things. And sometimes things come together in a kind of assemblage and form a constellation of random bits. And for a moment, these bits make sense. For a moment, few cyclists create, I, I know I need to get off this, uh, <laughs> this, this, this example, but I'm somehow drawn to it. Um, for a moment, these cyclists create this third leg in between the ongoing traffic in a moment, and then, and then it disappears. Uh, for a moment, some random elements, and they are kind of random, the nails or the pins and the iron, the, the bicycle wheel and the chair, for a moment they come together, and for whatever reasons, their coming together makes them stick. But it could be that if you put the iron on a chair, it doesn't stick. Why is that? It's kind of hard to know. And that's not so important, perhaps. Or maybe it's important, but what is also important is that we have here a completely different way of thinking what is an art thing or what is an art object. Yeah? Does it, start, does it make sense? So what I'm saying is that it's not like you need to now go and, you know, start making uh, ready mates or uh, simulac. You are already making. It's 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 all there. It's just about perhaps realizing that for an artwork to happen, you have to allow for a lot of this random interactions to happen because sometimes they will stick and many other times they will not. How do you get to the bicycle wheel and the stool? That we don't really know. Uh, when um, when uh, Soren Kierkegaard thought about these problems a long time ago, in the beginning of the 19th century, um, he said it's fear and trembling. When you feel the fear, and who is writing about fear? Susanna. Yeah, Susanna, yeah. Also look at Kierkegaard's fear and trembling. When you feel the fear and you're trembling inside, that's how you know that it is right. That the bicycle and the wheel and the chair belong together. So you follow your senses, no? Yeah? You follow your senses? You follow your senses or something like that, yes. Um, but you don't begin from a plan. You don't begin from an idea that you then go and execute. Because then you will always end up with something like that. All you kind of say, all you do in when you work in the simulacra mode, in the, in the mode of the ready-made, you basically say there is a world of things moving at different speeds in different directions. That is the world. Sometimes these things can clump together and create some rhythm. And I can grab this rhythm. And that becomes my artwork. Yeah? And can you see the rhythm of this work? So let's look at it again and look at it carefully. So first, I think, there is a rhythm here of enclosed and, enclosed and open spaces. So the wheel creates one enclosed shape, and the stool, which is also round, creates another enclosed shape. Yeah? But they are kind of not completely aligned, but they both, they're both of these round things. Then there are the legs of the chair, 
yeah, that kind of emanate from this central point, yeah, as a sort of um, <coughs> well, the the, the 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 seat of the chair is a kind of hub. It's like, almost like the hub in the middle of the bicycle. Yeah, these two objects suddenly have so many common qualities. They almost look like the uh, they have some genetic similarity. The stool and the bicycle with yeah, because these are quite like the sprockets of the they are called sprockets. Spokes. Spokes. So spokes. Yeah, they are like the spokes of the wheel, and the slight elongation here, the thickness of the leg, and the way it narrows down, kind of reminds you of the way this arm is first thick and then narrows down. So you, you start to kind of notice all these rhythms built into this world. So there is the rhythm of this thick becomes thin. Then there is the rhythm of the uh, these elongated lines emanating from a center. And that again gives you some kind of. And then you have something else going on here. And then there is this thing. And this coming together seems to work. Why does it work? It works because it creates a rhythm. If it didn't create a rhythm, it wouldn't work. What is the rhythm then in the what is the rhythm in the iron? Hmm? The nails create a very clear sense of rhythm. There is also, an, isn't there something about? Yeah. And it's also because it's uh, um, again to this optical illusion, if it's important or not. But um, then, uh, when you look on the nails and from um, from um, in front of it, then it becomes also like a triangle. So that every nail is somehow mirroring the object itself. Every nail is mirroring the whole object. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's almost like this shape yeah. in every nail. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. But there is also something I think about violence in, in and both the nail and the iron on their own are kind of objects of violence as well. They are because they are these hard things made of what? Of iron. I don't know, something like that. <coughs> they're also about contact with the surface. And yet it's in contact with the air. Yeah, 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 that's right. And it's almost like, you know, this needs to be turned upside down for the wheel to actually function as a wheel. Yeah? But then only one of them can be up at any one time. If the wheel is the right way up, if the chair is the wrong way up. Yeah? And here you have something more to do with um, the possibility of movement. Well, you, you can say a lot of things about, about um, these objects and read them in different ways, but, but it just, just opens you to somehow get the sense of how in approaching simulacra in this way, the verse and Tushan in their own ways compel us to look back at the whole history of art and see it for, for what it is as a quite um, narrow, fixated approach that privileges only one way of looking at the world via representation. And that's, that's the kind, that's the perversion. That is the danger that these works might, um, might bring. What, is, uh, what else is? Uh, Can I just ask on these? Because our discussion has been, you know, it's quite formalistic. Uh, the shapes corresponding. Yeah, yeah. It's quite idea driven. Yeah. So we've kind of been sucked into the same discussion of these as we would have done, I think, if you know, ones that do representation on the others. I mean, that's these, you know, we're talking then in terms of meaning and the kind of gesture of the event of putting it in an art gallery and what this means for the history of art and culture. And it's all very idea driven. I mean, not that, I mean, which is great. I, I, th I think you're a right. different discourse. Yeah, I, I think you are completely right. And what does it, what does it tell us? The, the, that, that's how it is. You can't escape. It's hard. It's really hard. I think these works 
offers a, a kind of glimpse into what potential art has, but it's very, very hard to hold on to it. And we are all the time somehow within the representational discourse, even when we try to be on its kind of edge, we can never be disengaged from it. And you're right, you know, these, these objects now are celebrated and valorized art objects. They are sitting in museums alongside all the other representational artworks, and they, of course, them same, this, themselves became representational of a specific way of thinking and of um, this kind of rebelliousness against representation. So, yeah, um, that just means that we need new ones. How does, I have a question, how does this apply? Uh, for example, to the images of Thomas Demand, or there's like the video work Nightlife of Supran Gaillard. Yeah. I was thinking because this intro scene is this model he made from the thinker in front mm -hmm. of the museum of uh, Cleveland. It yeah. was destroyed and was already a model. And so I think somehow it's connected to those things. So you were asking about um, who's, who's work? Uh, Thomas Demand. Oh, and then there's Prangaya, because he made a specific work, yeah. Nightlife, where in the beginning, opening scene, he, um, it's a video, he's video yeah. So it's a 3D video, and the intro is that uh, the uh, thinker appears, it's, it's uh -huh. turning, and it's very, very slowly going up. Yeah. And, but it's a, he casted a model uh -huh. from, from the thinker, which yeah. is the museum of yeah. which is already a production. So I yeah. try to understand how how artists who work in this kind of way, uh, how this would apply to what we're talking about. Well, it's, it's, uh, I think the answer is that it's complicated. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, or maybe it's not so complicated. I, you know, everyone is somehow post Dushani. Yeah, um, but that's of course not the only thing you can see in these works. But if, if looking at the ready-mades allows you a way of looking at Thomas Demand, or looking at, at, at his work as somehow interrogating the ready-made through the photographic prism, I think that's, that, that can only be a good thing. That can only um, be helpful. Um, okay, any, any questions? Any thoughts? So how this all stands to what you are thinking about in relation to the research paper. Um, like, like this for me is really useful because I kind of think I was thinking when I decided the topic I was thinking the moment in time made something and I decided to make my artwork yeah. from my idea from my mind yeah. to something concrete I'm already setting up limitations, yeah. so I'm already killing my own That's right. That's right. Because, I guess another way you could look at the anime is you could say, it kind of rejects uh, an explanation. Yeah. It's almost like if the, the iron is saying, I don't want to be an iron, so yes. it could be anything. That's right, that's right, yes, yes, yes. Um, And I think that's, that's perhaps why the wheelchair became so emblematic of the, the, sorry, the, 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 the wheel um, on the chair became so emblematic of the ready-made because it kind of ready-made is always about this infinity loop that is continuously reflecting back upon itself, a kind of um, mise en beam or this you know, being trapped between two mirrors constantly reflecting because this is the state of being undecidable yeah and um, so I don't think it's about somehow going dividing artworks into representational and simulacra it's not about that it's about realizing that these forces always coexist it's an artwork maybe is a kind of hand-to-hand -hand combat of simulacra and representation. But it doesn't, if you have a representation and it makes you think of something else, isn't that taking you into the simulacra? Yes, it could be. 
it could do. Um, and the other issue is that you're, you kind of get sucked down the plug hole of art endlessly just talking about art, which is kind of ultimately what the really made is doing. Um, well, that's to, break, to break out of that. Well, that that's exactly what uh, Peter Osborne's claim against simulacra and against uh, Deleuze and, and, and postmodernity post -post in general, that um, it becomes a na naval gazing exercise. You basically, it's, it's art that is only about art. So what can we answer to that? What do you think? Is it, is, is it fair criticism of, uh, of simulacra? Um, I think Deleuze could come to the rescue in the, in the article we just read. But what do you think? So there is this objection. That like. says the problem with oh it's all very well you know we're making ready mates but in the end it is incredibly self indulgent then you start making art which is just interested in what makes something art and it it stops dealing with the real world look people are starving there is you know there are real painful problems and you just you know deal with art and and, and what makes something whether it is an object or an artwork, and don't you have more important things to make your work about? <coughs> what could you answer to that? I think for me, what they talk about them kind of separate themselves from art and real life, they already put the inside of what is called real life is operational. So, okay, yeah. good, yes, all right. Um, what, does mean, well, how, what does it mean though? So, so people will come to you and say, Lexi, why don't you make why don't you make art about things that matter? I, um, I think like sometimes um, uh, people are It's, a, it's an important thing to think about. It's a claim that comes, comes up quite often about contemporary art, the kind of um, not performing its duty, and being too self-indulgent. But it's not, it's not going to perform its, if there is a duty, it's not going to perform its duty for every person that sees it. I think. Uh, not performing as duty means, I think, on one hand, not pursuing the idea of the beautiful, but we and, and on the other, will change. It's not making things change. No, it's, it's not comparing us, yeah, to build a better world. Yeah. Uh, but why do we have to build a better world through our artwork? That's why should we do that in the first place? Yeah, that's bullshit. Or you're pleading guilty and you're just saying the sentence shouldn't be too harsh. But if you if you make an artwork thinking that the artwork needs to have a name or some kind of, I don't know, um, like influence on the world, aren't you already like thinking about something else than an artwork? Mm -hmm. Because when you have an object to say, okay, the pen is for writing, okay, if you're thinking about something that needs to have a you know, a function in, in the world, I think you're already thinking about an object more than an artwork. And that doesn't mean that if you create something, it could be useful for the world. But I think if you start with this idea in mind, you're not really. I think another way of asking the same question, or maybe approaching it in a slightly different direction, is on what level a ready made is political? Does it make any sense to talk about it as political, or is it rejecting politics? Because what I think Matthew kind of saying, following um, um, Peter Osborne, is that the ready-made or simulacra is turning its back, as the letters say, turning away from the political. Do you think it's true? No. OK. And so now we're going to say why not. I'm saying not turning, I'm saying it's acquiescing. 
not turn it away. I will do it in the And it's um, not challenging the fundamental status quo. It's operating within it and taking it for granted. Do you think so? Uh, do you agree with that? think in terms of the ready-made, like when you're looking at it, it reveals like a different way of looking or a different way of understanding. And from looking at a new way of looking, it shifts how you see. It turns representationalism sort of inside out, short. You, it refers to it, and that, that's why they're entangled. But it puts it into question, which is, which you could say is a political act. Only into question from the elite that are part of the system. It wouldn't strike a chord with the hungry or the enslaved. Or, or, but what would? Um, well, <coughs> revolutionary art that stirs people to action. I mean, I'm not saying that interests me, but I'm just saying. Only within the art world, it's not remotely revolutionary. Oh well, that's it, but isn't, isn't that isn't that now we sort of um, move to a different question? I think I think the, there is a really interesting question about what is the politics of a ready-made? Does it have a politics? Number one. Two. What is the politics of a ready-made? There is, of course, a different question that Martin now brought up here about you know um, the way art operates in the world, and, and I think that is, to, to my mind, this is a different question, because I think it is uh, important, but it's not going to help us if we think about how this, because there are also representation of artworks that are for the elite. You know, and they have a definition in the worlds of some very rich people. And um, so that, I think, is, that is uh, somehow different. But I, but I really do want us to think about what kind of politics can we attribute to a ready-made? Or even, let's say, let's take the, the very first one, the uh, Uriah. Um, what, what kind of politics we can attribute to that? Well, exactly. It was a exactly. <coughs> what do you mean by politics? There's a challenge within the, the, the time period. It was probably absolutely disgusting for someone mm -hmm. to put a urinal in a gallery. So it's immediately challenging and being political because it's going against what is, of, at that time, what mm -hmm. is seen as correct and a right way to act. Yeah, 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 that's right. I think probably yep. um, um, the arena itself, yeah. and how people see our gallery, or sense our gallery, or give them themselves the definition in the society, what is it that our gallery is in that society, actually, is, uh, for me, is like more matter than what it, it is, because they step into our gallery, they have the sense that everything right here should be artwork. When they yes. say that, yes. they kind of, that kind of stuff kind of damage or break up their how to say that, um, ideally or fantasy about what this art should be, yeah, yeah, so they yeah. kind of feel angry about that. So yeah. I think um, what yeah. I, I want to really what, what it does, this work, at the very least, I think, it surprises. It somehow suggests that art can be something quite different from what it was. It is different, it might be disgusting, it might be revolting, it might be not all the things. But that there is a potential for radical change and difference. Yeah? Now, if art, uh, and that's by the way, that's that's actually Adorno himself is saying um, in um, the aesthetic theory. Um, if art disgusts us or revolts us or makes us angry, then it is often because art strives to keep reminding us that another world is possible. Another world with different rules, with different logic, is possible. And when we look at something and we say, but this is not art, but how can it be? But how can you tolerate something like that? This is a monstrosity. Um, art is performing its political function of keeping the door open. <coughs> But keeping the door open for something new to happen. But when the ready-made already become the norm of the art. Completely right. Yeah, then what happens? Then you need to put this urinal on a t-shirt. You need to make a perfume bottle out of it. You need to keep recycling it and reproducing it in loads and loads of other contexts.
to maintain its freshness. 